Thanks, Kathleen. Good morning to all of you. Uh, you know, I, I have this habit of following Kelvin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it started with the National Science Board. I followed him. And then he became the chair of the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Council of Research. And then I followed him. <laughs> and then he went to the Office of Science Technology Policy. And then, um, you know, I was the acting director of NSF. And then I followed him. <laughs> and now today I'm following him again <laughs> in this talk. So it's a habit. And I would say it's a good habit. I mean, having listened to his energy, I mean, I would say that, first of all, we all owe a debt of gratitude to Kelvin for the years that he spent in the Office of Science Technology Policy and really spearheaded a number of ideas as well as innovative ways in which the nation can move forward and advocated for that. So we truly owe a debt of gratitude to Kelvin for his leadership. And he continues. I mean, he's a man of uh, you know, tremendous energy, and it's always, it's, it's always great to be with him. So what I wanted to do today is, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I know that you all were talking about glass, 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 glass. So I told, I'll, I'll break the mold. A oh, break is not the right word to use in glass. Um, so, but I thought I'll break the mold by doing something that is different. That is, how might we uh, know a little bit more about the National Science Foundation? Some of you may know NSF, so pardon me for that. But I'm going to try to keep it as interesting as possible in terms of not only what NSF is, but where NSF is heading into. I hope that is useful and that I'm sure, as Kelvin nicely concluded his remarks, that you as a community can be a tremendous exemplar. You already are in some ways, as I see, the multifaceted nature in which you're moving things forward, how innovative you are, how transdisciplinary you are, how integral you are in terms of basic research to, how integrative you are in terms of basic research to translational as well as industry outcomes and other outcomes. So I think, I think you're already doing that. So as to, to the call that, um, that Kelvin put out, I think you'll be a great <coughs> exemplar in terms of how we take this idea forward as we are thinking about the future of not only NSF, but what the national science and technology ecosystem can do for us and should do for all of us. So why don't I get started? I think this is my cue to move my slides <coughs> forward. Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with NSF, uh, I think my voice projects, so if, if it is not, let me know. I don't like to get pinned to a podium. I'm not that kind of a guy. So uh, basically, because I give lectures, I'm an academic after all. So uh, you know, when you look at uh, NSF, some of you might have already known about the mission of NSF. Uh, Kelvin nicely laid out the framework, uh, thanks to Vannevar Bush and his fantastic conceptualization, and then advancing that idea with the, with the president that you know, the Congress enacted in 1950 the formation of the National Science Foundation. And with the following mission, and the mission being that we'll have this significant focus on promoting the progress of science, advancing national health, prosperity, and welfare, <coughs> and securing the national defense. All these objectives but fundamentally promoting the progress of science. And science in the broadest form, when I talk about science, you know, my colleagues in engineering, and I'm an engineer, always tell me, but that's also engineering. I said, yes, yes, engineering too, and technology too, and a whole host of things. And so, one of the things that I get excited about when I talk about this mission, is this mission has stood the test of time. It is now more than seven decades, 72 years since the founding of NSF. This mission still holds true, still drives progress, still makes things happen in the nation, and I have no doubt that it is going to propel us forward into the next 75 years and beyond. And that's something to say about some, some vision that was created, because typically these days, the fashion of organization is, let's change our mission and vision every few years, right? And so this is a phenomenal task, that a phenomenal uh, sort of credit to, um, to what Maneeval did uh, many, many years ago. But now where are we? We are in a defining moment, as I would call it. This defining moment is characterized by a couple of things. The first thing is global competition. When we talk about global competition, and, and um, Kelvin did talk about China, when you talk about global competition, oftentimes there is this reaction to global competition as, oh, we should not fall behind. What I always have looked at competition as, even personally, is it now only brings the best out of you. It makes you work harder more focused, more energized, to do better than we would ever do. And therefore, for me, this moment of global competition, as important as it, to me, as it is to me have defensive strategies and so on, 
But the best form of strategy is the offense strategy. That's what I've learned from playing sports. Defense is not the strategy, offense is the strategy. So how do we then take this moment and see how we might inspire us to do better, faster, stronger than we have ever done? And so that's how, that's how I look at this moment in time in terms of what the global competition is challenging us to do. At the same time, we also have this challenge, which becomes an opportunity, because challenges are always an opportunity. We all know that. When we look around, we find there are these, as Kelvin introduced, missing millions of talent across all geographical areas of our nation. All states of the nation, rural, urban, socioeconomic, demographic, racial diversity, whatever, however you want to slice and dice it. The bottom line is that we are leaving a lot of talent and ideas behind. Domestic ideas and talents behind. That is an unacceptable future. And therefore, what we need to do is to double down on our efforts to see how we can inspire, nurture, motivate, and make this talent real for our nation. Yes, and then we want to add, in an augmentative way, every possible global talent that we can get here, such that the domestic and global talent at full force and full scale is what we need to address this challenge of what global competition is all about, that we can do a lot better. And the good news in all of this is I walk the halls of the Congress even during the confirmation process, as well as, you know, I, I even today, I'm going to be in the White House a little bit later. I have to rush out. That's why after this meeting, if I, if I don't stay back, please don't take it as anything personal. But on Friday, I am with, with one of the um, Congressman, uh, Chairman Cartwright of the Commerce Justice Science Committee in his hometown of Scranton. I said, Congressman, I will come to your hometown and tell you what we can do there. On Monday, I'm with Senator Schumer in, in Rochester, New York, talking about him close to Cornell, um, uh, close to Corning Glass, rather. So we are going to be there talking about what prosperity that we can have unleashed. So it doesn't matter where we are. The point that is to be made is that there is total bipartisan support for this moment that we are talking about. There is no dissonance. If you read something in the papers, I would say that you don't want to you know, necessarily give full credence to that. Because I can tell you from personal interactions, there is full bipartisan support for advancing the nation's science, technology, engineering future forward. That there is tremendous innovative potential. There is tremendous ideas and talent that needs to be advanced for the benefit of our nation. So there is full bipartisan support. We may argue about some terms. We may argue about how to do it, how to get there. But the fundamental issue of you know, should we get there? How fast we should get there? No, no arguments. Just want to let you know that's the good news. Let's talk about a few things related to the mission that I talked about in terms of the vision. So when I came in, I looked at the unbelievable progress I have been, a, you know, a recipient of NSF grants, and what it has made possible in terms of the own ideas that I was able to foster and advance, but also train talent of different forms. And so NSF has done a fantastic job in the last seven decades or more, 72 years, of unleashing unbelievable ideas and talent all across the nation. And it has always kept us in the vanguard in terms of frontiers of discoveries in science, engineering, and more. So clearly, NSF's pillar should be how do we further advance the frontiers, no question about that, and I call it strengthening at speed and scale. That's what this moment demands. How do we strengthen at speed and scale in advancing the frontiers of science, technology, and engineering into the future? But then the central pillar, which is literally the central pillar, is while we are doing that, we need to make sure that we are doing that with the mindset of inclusivity, accessibility for all talent and ideas across the nation, to the earlier point that I made. And the third pillar being that in doing so, that we secure global leadership. By global leadership, I don't mean that one nation is a leader and other are followers. Not at all. To again, to Kelvin's point, that like-minded countries who share in our scientific values and values of openness, transparency, reciprocity, research integrity, respect for intellectual property, and aspirations that we share, how can we all work together and share in this leadership 
and be in the vanguard of innovation. Because that's what is needed to solve global grand challenge problems. We are in a moment of pandemic and we all recognize that. Doesn't matter what those might be. But in order to do any of these or all of these, we need to partner, partner, partner like no tomorrow. When I came into the agency, the first two weeks, I was just picking up the phone and talking to every agency leader and asking about how might we hyper collaborate, hyper partner. Because it's not NSF that NSF can do whatever it does, but NSF can do a lot more, a lot better, a lot faster by partnering with every other agency, every industry leader that I talked to, and the COVID times were you know, a challenge but also an opportunity. I swung my chair from the right to the left, moved from Maine to California, was able to engage with many, many, many constituencies, many industry leaders, many entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, tribal nation leaders, historically black colleges, university leaders, Hispanic serving institution leaders, you name it. So that we might listen to what is going on, what might be done better, how can we configure ourselves to strengthen at speed and scale. And of course, international partners. Just in the last week, I met with a group from Israel, two days ago with the Indian ambassador visiting NSF with his team. Constantly, three weeks ago with Australia, Italy, South Korea, you name it. Every, every other week I have some delegation coming in to see how we might hyper partner. So I just wanted to make sure that we are putting all of this to, together in order to make progress and that the spirit of innovation is what, what's going to move us into the future. And so when I look at the priorities of NSF here for, it's just the following three things. How do we strengthen the great work that we are doing through what I call established NSF? 260 Nobel laureates were funded by NSF. You look at every year Nobel Prize, whether it's economics, physics, or chemistry, it doesn't matter what it is. You will find that NSF has funded them or initiated their, 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 their research right in the very, very early stages. Let's take Jennifer Dubna, for example. In 2020, when she got the CRISPR, Nobel Prize for CRISPR, Jennifer was funded by NSF right from the career grant level, and she won the Allen T. Waterman Award, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's what NSF is fantastic at is investing in people early and nurturing people and talent early and then continuing to sustain those investments over time to ensure that we deliver the goods. But then we need to inspire the missing millions. And when I came into the agency, I said, we need to make sure that we translate technology fast, fast, and not let years pass by and let things fall through. NSF has got a lot of success stories to talk about. Just last week I was with Senator Ben Sass and the CEO of um, uh, you know, Ginkgo Bioworks from, from Boston. And he was telling me how NSF made possible all the work, all through the support that they have, not only in basic research work, in center scale research work, SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Programs, at phase one, phase two A, two B, everything that NSF provided. And then some other agencies also providing some support. And then, he secured venture capital investment because of the maturation of the technologies. Now it's a $6 billion company. There are many, many examples. Qualcomm was an SBAR funded project of NSF. And you might have heard this company called Google. In 1994, two graduate students submitted a proposal to NSF for a digital libraries project. Four years later, they finished an annual report and said they're founding a company called Google. So NSF has many examples of these kinds of things. But how might we do more faster? And so we've developed, we, are, we have developed a cross-cutting directorate. NSF has not had a new directorate in the last 30 years. Nothing wrong with that. But when I came and we said we have to have a directorate which, has, which focuses on technology, innovation, and partnerships, a cross-cutting directorate. And we launched it within one year. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in South by Southwest launching this technology, innovation, partnerships directorate. We have to move fast. And that's one of the characteristics of competing and out-competing. Also, when I came to NSF, because you may, you may or may not realize, because oftentimes people think of NSF as, oh, that's the place where they discover black holes. <laughs> now, yes, absolutely, we do that, and they're very proud of that. We make that possible. We don't do anything, we just make things possible. But NSF is a lot more than that. So how do I communicate that? So I conceptualize this, this, this thing which I present to you called the DNA of NSF. One strand of the DNA, is what I call curiosity-driven, discovery-based exploratory research or explorations. That's what NSF is known for, doing really well in all disciplines, geosciences, biosciences, computer sciences, engineering, mathematical, physical sciences, social behavioral economic sciences, and more. 
But what is not as well known about NSF, and I've given you some examples of that, is the other strand of the DNA, which is what I call use-inspired, solutions-focused translations or innovations. Oftentimes, the feeling is explorations make possible translations through a pipeline. But we all know that. In class, you know that very well. That explorations and translations are highly synergistic and symbiotic. Explorations make possible translations. Translations make possible more explorations. That's how it works. That's how, the, how, how, that's how it works. And so NSF makes possible both these things. And now we need to see how we can strengthen and speed and scale. Now to glass. I'm sure all of you are either wearing a glass or a contact lens. And if you don't have either, you're going to wear a glass or a contact lens. There's only two kinds of people. You either are wearing glasses or contact lens, or you're going to wear glasses or contact lens. <laughs> NSF's investments in the 70s, early investments in the 70s around polymers and hydrogels, can be, you know, we call them tire tracks. How do you go back and find out where the fundamental discoveries were, and what made these things possible, and how do we attach where these things happened, and NSF projects have been funded, which resulted in plastic eyeglasses and contact lenses, thanks to them that I can drop my glasses without breaking them, which I do every day. <laughs> Optical coatings. Again, tremendous investments by NSF. And thanks to that, we have scratch resistant glass, not only for eyeglasses, but for solar cells. <clears throat> or I'm sure all of you are having one of these devices. These, the glass that is here. How can it be scratch resistant? I, I managed to scratch this too. Though. Um, <laughs> so, and then the investments that we made in towards metallic glass, amorphous metals. Metallic glass. And the foundation of companies like super cool metals. Unbelievable research done in universities like Yale University. All the glass fiber optic cables. And communication is made possible through that. But even, even more exciting is how do we go inside the body for surgeries through fiber optic cables. Great work done at MIT, the material sciences work that is done at MIT. And then in clean energy technologies. Resulting in many startups, as you can see the message here, a lot of startups appearing. That's what I mean by the symbiotic nature of exploration, translation, translation, exploration. Ubiquitous energy is a fantastic startup. In the interest of time, I'm just not going to belabor any further. I know you're already behind schedule. So I want to keep myself to schedule. Um, so when you look at the designing element for future at NSF, therefore, it's not these pillars of rhetorics but it is how people work together. How do people look at themselves as organized in a way that is very amorphous? That they can all interact with each other and explore the various synergies. And then, with some of those thematic areas of integrative activities of international science and engineering, OIC and OIA, then we are launching this new technology innovation partnerships. So that, that directorate, can leverage things fast, make things fast, as well as energize things further. I know AI was not as well, um, you know, uh, as, as well um, liked by Kelman when he talked about it. Being an AI researcher, I take exception to that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but we have enough problems, and that's a very, very important point, actually, to make. The problems of AI today is because we did not have the social, behavioral, <coughs> and economic senses in humanities right at the beginning of the design process, but has become an afterthought. And that's why we're having the problems of bias, ethics, privacy, security, you name it. So this teaches us something, that the fusion of disciplines is not an afterthought, but before you actually envision these new ideas. So we're accelerating translation through many, many programs. And this is what we launched as a new directorate in addition to all the great things that's going on. How do we accelerate public-private partnerships? How do we get better pathways for entrepreneurship? We have many programs already, but we want to scale them in a very big way. How do we build regional innovation engines? Calvin talked about the Bell Lab. The Bell Lab like constructs everywhere across the nation around teams that is more, more akin to the place. It's not about just technology. Where could the most exciting thing about the future of agriculture be? Maybe in the region of Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Illinois and Indiana, maybe that's the best crucible, a living laboratory where we can build the best entrepreneurial ecosystem and industries being, you know, birthed there like no tomorrow. How might we do that? So we've invested in terms of some AI institutes around those kinds of ideas. Lab to market, platforms, translational accelerators, of course. 
So this is the fundamental point that how do we bring more convergence, not only about disciplines converging, how do we bring more industry, cities, state, K-12 systems, community college systems, university research systems, of course, and a whole lot more to converge and work together. And then if we do that right, clearly, a lot can emerge out of that. And that's what NSF is heading into the future. And I look forward to the partnership that we will have with all of you. And I hope you will now, I used to tell my students this, when you go for the TGIF parties, talk about science, <laughs> until the person walks away from you. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want you to do, whenever you go to any party, have you heard about NSF? <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> until they walk away from you. <laughs> so thank you all for the opportunity of being here.